welcome to the Pastured Pig Podcast, where we share the successes and challenges of raising pigs on pasture. We talk to producers all over the country, from small homesteads to large commercial pasture operations. Whether you're new to pastured pigs or have been raising hogs for decades, we hope you hear new ideas and new perspectives on pasturing hogs. Here's your host, Troy McClung. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Pastured Pig Podcast. Uh, again, just excited with uh, knowing that so many people are listening to the podcast, getting great feedback. Um, appreciate those that have left a review and given us a rating. If you haven't, please do that. That helps other people find us. Uh, just whatever podcast feed you're using, uh, go ahead and give us a, a, a rating there and feel free to write a review. Appreciate it. And obviously, constructive criticism is uh, welcome as well. Well, tonight, uh, as I'm recording this intro, it's a nice, cool evening here in West Virginia. I don't know if you all can hear the uh, crickets and tree frogs in the background. Nice little ambiance, uh, nice setup for recording here. But I have a kind of a funny story, a funny situation here um, with, with our sows. I have one of my older sows. She's getting a little long in the tusk there, if, if that's the right term. She uh, had a split hoof. I, I noticed when... Um, we were feeding her one morning that um, her her left front trotter, actually right front, no left front trotter was uh, was split and had kind of kind of looked bad. So I thought, well, I really need to get down and look at that. I need to see underneath it, make sure there's not any foreign bodies, anything like that. Uh, but you know, she's 500 plus pounds. She's not too apt to me coming over and grabbing her by the by the leg and twisting around and everything. So. Uh, I've never done it before. I'd read a lot of things about it and I've seen YouTube videos about uh, sedating your pig by giving them beer. So I uh, bought some beer and used that and and it was kind of a, a funny uh, situation for us. We actually did a video of it. We, we put it on our YouTube channel, which is Red Toolhouse Homestead on uh, on YouTube. You can just search Red Toolhouse and we should pop up. But it was a video that just went live uh, yesterday, I believe, which would be September the 3rd. So um, check that out if you want to want to see our experience with a uh, semi-drunk pig. We were, we were able to look at her trotter. It, it's fine, actually. She's just uh, she's busted on something, but no infection or anything. But uh, that was a neat, uh, neat experience. That's definitely going to be something we keep in the medicine kit is a uh, six-pack or a case of beer. It uh, obviously has multifunction around here, so... Well, uh, diving into our conversation uh, today, we have uh, we actually had this guest on in our first episode, going all the way back to episode one. It's Brian Rogers with uh, Berkshire Prime Pork, and uh, Brian. The first episode talked about his his setup and his operation and what he's got going on there. Uh, but we brought him back. Uh, we talked a lot off mic about his um, biosecurity regimen. His uh, his health regimen, his disease control, all those type of things. And he's he's pretty uh, uh, detailed. He's very deliberate in what he does with his biosecurity. So I wanted to have him back on and talk about that specifically. So this is one of those podcasts where we drill down and get very topic specific. Uh, may get a little nerdy at some point, but I appreciate Brian taking the time to, to get into that. Not that I'm calling him a nerd. It's just that he and I kind of geeked out on, on some of the details of biosecurity. So uh, let's dive right into that. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Pastured Pig Podcast. I'm your host, Troy McClung. I'm uh, just excited that uh, you all take the time to listen. Um, I have with me today as a, uh, as a guest someone that's been on the podcast before, but we're going to talk specifically about uh, the specific topics, obviously, and uh, we can go back and look. We had him. This was actually our first podcast episode, episode one, so you can go back and listen to that if you like. But I have with me Brian Rogers from Berkshire Prime Pork. Welcome, Brian. Hey, Troy. Uh, hey, everybody. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, come back and talk with us. I know you just literally finished up uh, chores for today. Oh, yes, most definitely. It was a hot one today in Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things that it's, as a pig producer, where you, you, you welcome summer and all the things that come from it, but halfway through it, you're like, okay, I'm ready for the next stage. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Well, in, in the East Coast, it's been hammered with it this year, but so far we've really been taken kindly to it. We've been in the mid to lower 90s all summer, and I shouldn't rub it in, but even then the humidity is unbearable. 
Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I, I could. The humidity kills us here in West Virginia as well. It gets a little excessive. You guys, yes. You guys been doing all right with rain, or have you been inundated with rain? Very. We've been we've been very good in the last few weeks. It's been really dry, which is kind to the hog farmer. But uh, but yeah, we've been pretty wet all year, all winter. Yeah. So uh, and and, and on topic for today, that's really going to hit home because you, you got the diseases, you got the pneumonia, and so we're going to talk about all that. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that was a very good segue. Um, so so people are wondering what our topic is going to be today. We're going to talk about disease, disease control, biosecurity. Uh, Brian's done a lot of uh, of research on that, and and again to to really understand his perspective, you you need to go back to listen to episode one. Uh, and understand just the amount of growth that he's going through and the amount of production he's doing. So that it really was a baptism by fire uh, uh, to learning all this process, I assume. Well, okay. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's uh, let's do this. So for those that haven't listened to episode one and haven't had a chance to go back, so that they don't feel they got a bailout right now, uh, give us a forty thousand foot elevation view of of description of what you've got going on there in Arkansas. Uh, we started out with one sow, moved to three sows, moved to 18 sows, moved to really 18 plus 18, so 36 sows, and we got a lot of keeper gilts, and we run about seven or eight boars now, and now we produce about three to 400, sometimes 500 piglets. It just depends on how many sows I'm going to be holding on to, and uh, a lot of it's for production for other farmers. We sell a lot of wean piglets, and so a lot of we've gotten into selling less meat to our customer base and more to other farmers and really focusing on better breeding stock. And, uh, it's all about genetics at this very moment. And so, uh, a lot, a lot of the problems that go on with farming, you don't see it on such a small scale with five piglets and, and, and two sows, you really start to amplify and see different little niches of diseases once you start getting to 200 and 300 and your your herd numbers get up a lot higher so that's where we're at is we're not full of diseases by any means but that's where we're at is we're at management of any biosecurity issues and there's been a learning curve with a couple of things like ileitis and um there's things that you just need to be vaccinating for as far as since, since we're out on the pasture so we've hit a curve in that bell curve to where it's time to manage things a little bit tighter because there's a lot more risk involved and a lot more money and gosh you could wake up to a disease and it all be gone in a sense yeah my veterinarian said you you don't want to be the guy losing a million overnight yeah yeah that would suck <laughs> that de- yeah that definitely takes the wind out of your sails and, and, and like you say the just the nature the natural element of the more organisms you have to keep alive the more potential you have to to have those issues arise so it it makes sense absolutely just, yeah volume is is you know the main issue there well let's um let's dive into what what when it when it comes to your setup when it comes to your farm what are some of the basics some of the 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 boilerplate processes you do for a disease control or biosecurity well uh number one we do a lot of experimenting with genetics and as far as this is good this is great this is even better and so i'm having to bring in breeders occasionally so for we have 30 to forty thousand. got to break that down i've uh, got two farm sites now so it's separated and we do not transfer equipment. We do not transfer feed bags and feed. They're totally separate in that sense. So if I go to farm B, we're spraying down. We're um, if, right before our roll on farm site, we tech troll the trailer. We tech troll the tires and the undercarriage, and then we roll on farm site. Um, I don't use the same farm trailer. I do use the same vehicle, but we do what we can as far as that goes. Um, total different boots, total different shoes on the other farm site. But that can be carried over to your farm um, if you have five sows. Um, that's the same theory. When you come on your farm site with five sows from 10 hours on the road or going to the state fair or county fair, because I know we're really in season for the state and county fairs, mm-hmm. gosh, um, there's a lot of diseases that you can get just by walking around the fairgrounds. Um, if you don't already have ileitis, you can really pick that up. You can pick up myco. Um, you can pick up PRRS really easy. 
Um, and if you're a breeding herd, it's a big, big deal. If you're not a breeding herd, you just got a couple grower hawks, you got a lot less risk to manage. Yeah. So, so, so for us in our processes, it's all about the breeding stock and protecting tomorrow's generation. And so we don't bring things on site that come from used farm equipment. Um, we do, but there's a strict protocol for what we do with that equipment. Um, we will wash it and pressure wash it, anything, any cracks. We'll take it apart every piece if we have to. We do tech troll it. Um, and if it's not going to melt, I'm going to get my 400,000 BTU flamer out, and we're going to have fun with that. Um, well, you're not fooling and, around then, are you? <laughs> no, no. If, and some... I try to buy things that don't melt just so I get to use that thing. <laughs> right. No doubt. Well, there, there's, some, there's definitely some cool element there. Well, yeah. Uh, okay, so for those of us that don't know, what, what is tech trolling? Explain that to us specifically. Uh, there's several different sprays that you can use. Um, tech troll is the one that my veterinarian recommends for me to use. Okay. Um, I can't remember the name of the others at the moment, but uh, tech troll is a really popular one that you can get like at Valley vet, or I don't know if your local farm supply store will have it, but you can get it in a little aerosol can for just like your boots at the fair, or you can get it in a quart jar or a gallon concentrate that you can mix. I think it's two tablespoons per gallon of water, and I put it in a big backpack sprayer. Right. Um, so I, I've always got a gallon of it mixed up, and I just grab the sprayer if I need it. Yeah, so basically we're just talking about a, 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 a branded uh, disinfectant that you're, that you're using, and you're, you're yes. spraying your equipment. Yes, it, and it's your... specific for swine uh, in, in animals as far as livestock animals go. Hmm. Um, and it doesn't absolutely have to be rinsed off the residue. You can load your pigs after it, after it dries. Um, I always do rinse it. I'm just a little protective in that nature. Um, but yeah, I, I always, I've got a big metal trailer and it's got a metal floor. And so we power wash it. We let it dry. We, typically burn it with the flamer and then i will still tech troll everything because the fluid will will go between the cracks and everything so all different classes of diseases in transit if i'm taking that trailer back to my home farm i need it to be clean yeah um for example erysipelas it doesn't live outside of the animal very long so it's not it's not one that I'm really, really worried about. Heat's going to kill it. Dry air over a week is going to kill it. But if it was to rinse off in the soil on my farm, then it's going to live for a really long time. Yeah. And I'm actually, I'm sorry, I mean, I meant to have said leptospirosis. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I said erysipelas. But, uh, but well, yes. Okay, so, uh, so uh, yeah, this is this is definitely, I mean, we're, we're definitely getting into... Uh, pastured pig 400 level classes here pretty quickly so so let me let me back up and, and ask why why all these measures brian or what what prompted you did you uh, in in the time that you've been raising pigs is it just okay i really want to focus on this i want to protect my investment is it vet counseled you on this did you have loss that you've experienced what what was the catalyst for this um well i'm part of the pasture pig forum um and you'll get on there and you'll see people like last week I saw somebody say that um, one of my pigs, my vet said has diamond lesion disease where, which is erysipelas. Um, I've seen people have farrowing issues um, and they had leptospirosis probably. I'm, I'm obviously not the vet on the ground, but uh, they had a lot of deaths either at farrow or very shortly after farrow and they couldn't really explain it. It was just wasting away. And you know, some of those diseases don't really kick in at first. Some of those diseases take a week or two weeks. Uh, coccidiosis, for example, is a diarrhea condition, but it is impossible, practically impossible to get it before five days because it has to stay dormant and implant into the tract. So as a, as, a, as a pasture pig producer, I need to know my risks and I need to know my symptoms. Um, and I need to know how to attack it before it costs me a lot of money. So research ahead of time. It doesn't mean that I have had diseases. It means that I want to stay away from them and be knowledgeable. Um, 
but part of that goes to my veterinarian a big big part of that she she sees all the oh crap oh crap herds she gets phone calls and she goes and sees a million sick hogs with prrs or a million sick hogs with lepto diseases with with litters being aborted here and there and um she always tells me you need to vaccinate for this this and this and if you really want a reason just ask me for a sad story <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah. she says i've got a sad story for every recommendation that i'm going to give you um but she says i don't want to see you wake up in the morning broke yeah. so there's there's some really good biosecurity and, and and money management really when you think of it that way yeah definitely yeah it's asset protection for sure so that's that's the, that's the root of it all is uh, a little bit of its fear but a lot of its education and awareness as to what really is out there so you talked about some of the steps for biosecurity are are there additional steps that you're taking um on, on that side yes yeah the, you know and it's a little controlling but at the same time you you either do or you don't you either play play the roulette wheel or um you do what you want to do as far as that goes and so you take your own risk level but um so like i said i go and i get other breeding stock from other farms at times so we have a three-week quarantine measure it's off-site it's total 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 disconnected total different boots shoes clothes um, I do most all of my quarantine treatments and stuff, but at the end of that three weeks, we blood test for PRRS, we blood test for different leptos, parvo, erysipelas, uh, PCV. Um, we just, for the willy-nilly of it, we test for ileitis. Um, and I say that because almost every herd in America has ileitis. I'm just always, it costs me a dollar or two, so I'm just always curious. Mm. Um we test for mycoplasma, pneumonia. Um, we do not test for pneumonia or swine flu or rhinitis. Um, when I when I buy pigs, and I'm going to kind of hop back and forth here and there, but um, I'm just speaking of my protocol, but this is part of my protocol is rhinitis. We try to observe the sow herd. We try to observe where these piglets or where these gilts and sows are that we it come from because unless you just freshly acquired rhinitis it's going to be visible in your sow herd because you're going to have some up drawn up recessed snouts um that's one of the main indicators for it now in young piglets and young growers it's not really going to be uh i don't know how to say it but it's not really going to take its full effect yet and you won't visibly be able to see rhinitis um but so so vis visibly seeing the sow herd that's one of our little control measures is you need to see where the pigs are coming from where you're buying where they come from anyway so that's that's a that's a genetic thing that's a genetic control for us um we tech troll all of our equipment or we bleach it um we always have clean boots if i go to somebody else's farm i'm going to spend 20 bucks and buy a pair of boots i haven't worn on my farm just for their comfort just so they know I'm not bringing my farm to their herd. Yeah, wow. Um, so, so I always have, I, I, and people are like, wow, you don't have to do that, Brian. I'm like, no, I really, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to spend 500 bucks or six, seven, 800, 900 bucks with your farm. I'm going to bring a $20 pair of boots I can totally sterilize and use later. Yeah. Um, and so then we talk about used hog equipment, and there's certain, anything that's wood, I'd never buy anything that's wood. Um if it can't be taken apart or cleaned or framed, I'm probably not going to be doing that either. Um, visitors, visitors to my farm. I buy boots for my visitors as well. Um, so I got a size 10, 11, or 12. When you come to my farm, I'm going to be asking you that because I'm going to make sure you got a pair of boots that didn't come from your farm or from somewhere else. Right. Because I'm protecting my herd with that 20 bucks. Um, when I go and I buy pigs from somebody and I'm 10, 20, 30 hours away, and yes, I have driven that far, um, I avoid all truck stops. I don't stop at tractor, uh, um, um, flying J's or uh, Love's truck stop because that's where the livestock trucks go, the commercial livestock haulers. Oh, yeah. And there was a study that PRS, for example, has been found just inside the floor in the lobbies and i'm not saying every truck stop but 
it's found in the floor in the lobbies because these livestock haulers are back and forth and doing this and that, and that's just their central hub. So we use basic gas stations. We don't use the truck stops whenever we're on the road like that. Wow. I mean, that's, um, that's definitely things that you don't think of you know, initially. That's that's incredible. Yeah. And the fairs is another topic. Uh, the fairs are just kind of, I'm not going to say that they're just disease central, but at the same time, you've got thousands of pigs representing hundreds and hundreds of farms. Something's going on. It has to be. There's a, that's just the odds. Um, I'd take those odds to Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I think that's what you see with uh, when, when there is an outbreak, that's one of the first things they do, of course, is suspend all animal uh, events at, at these fairs to try to keep that from spreading. Cause you're right. It's like one big communicable disease opportunity there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they canceled the World Pork Expo, the, the largest swine gathering in the world this year just because of the African swine flu yeah. risk. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It definitely. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty daunting, I mean, that's a pretty daunting task uh, for biosecurity. And, I, and for those of uh, people listening that are small producers or even homestead producers, they may be like, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm, I don't even know where to begin. How? Yeah, this, uh, there may be smacking their forehead saying why am i even doing this and and we'll get to that in a bit because uh yeah, we're going brian and i are going to talk about uh, good places to start and what to research and those type of things but um yeah so so stay with us where uh, we may have thrown out some some long words here that uh, we all don't fully understand but we'll we'll get into that so so th- that's the biosecurity element so what are you doing as far as um uh, yeah, you, you've got a, a, a new litter that's farrowed, or you're actually bringing new stock in. What do you do as far as uh, vaccination regimens for those uh, those animals? Okay, um, so every I've met so many different people online on Facebook groups, and they have different names for their vaccines that they use. And so I won't get into the names of the vaccines that are used like the the companies that make them and whatnot but Merck makes a a good portion of what I do and then I think um five oh gosh I just forgot the Zoetis they make a good portion of like 20 30 40 percent of what I buy and um so I'm not going to get into individual Iliitis is made by so and so and so and so but um so when they're young we do an iliitis vaccine because iliitis is found in most every single herd in America. Um, first, I'll say that there's endemic diseases in America's swine that are basically everywhere. Endemic just means it's just everywhere, and there's really no point in attempting to control its spread. Um, uh, PCV, porcine circovirus, that's one of the new ones. It came over in the 90s from an Asian import um, and it went into Canada first and then came down from the Canadian border into the North America, the United States, I'm sorry. And uh, it's really just spread like wildfire. And they've developed some really good vaccines for it. So um, PCV is one of those that you really want to be able to control and take care of. Um, so we do that. I want to say that's a two or three. I got it all on a chart, and I didn't bring my chart with me, but I think that one starts around two or three weeks. You get the very first dose. Um, and that one, it appears with lesions and on the body, and it can also be called a post-weaning wasting syndrome. And so when you wean and that baby loses those immunities, that's when it really can kick in and really just take over those young growers. Mm. Um, so, so if you're – Either, either breeding stock or you're raising pigs for other people to grow out, that's one of the big ones you want to be able to control. Yeah, you may have it as a subclinical symptom, which means it's not violent and active in your herd. It could just be there in the background just hanging out. Um, so even if it's hanging out, you can still vaccinate for it, um, and, and that will protect the pigs that are vaccinated. And the same goes with Iliitis. Iliitis is pretty much everywhere. So just about every pig that's born is born with it. And they either get a flare up and they develop their own immunity or they die from it. Or you give them a vaccine and they develop immunity for the Iliitis. Um, Erysipelas, that's a similar similar topic. It's another one of those wasting disorders that, um, that I saw somebody on the pasture pig form last week said, oh, my vet had 
we had diamond lesion disease and so at three weeks i believe is when that one's administered and uh, it's like a one cc shot per chip, per piglet and that will protect the grow young growing piglets for erysipelas we you're also in a breeding herd going to be getting erysipelas parvo and lepto vaccines in what's called ferrosure now that that's a specific name of a vaccine i use i don't know what the others are called mm -hmm. um rhino shield or something like that I, I, I honestly don't quote me on that but so i use ferrosure gold b which protects for one extra strain of leptospirosis and that's leptobrotus lava and uh and it is here in America. I've heard several people say, well, we don't have Leptobrotus lava, but it, it is. It is transmitted through uh, ruminants. Um, so your your horses and your deer and stuff, they can spread that around and it'll grow in your soil. Um, and, and on that topic, they can develop their own natural immunities um, with Lepto and erysipelas, for example. So subclinical, it can be there. They can be exposed. They can develop their own immunities. But in the meantime, between being exposed and developing their own immunities, they can kick out abortions and and small numbers in litters. And nobody really wants to be farrowing three and four and five and six piglets when they could be farrowing nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Yeah. So part of that could be genetic. I'm not going to say that your sow who's producing six has one of those diseases that's that's for a blood test and for a vet to decide um so genetic issues aside if you have a good sow protecting her can give you stronger bigger litters mm -hmm. same for the boar and um, the i believe erysipelas can damage boar semen through high fevers and through through outbreaks and exposure of that nature um but the boar can also get his own natural immunities later on. Um, then there's myco pneumonia that myco is another one to vaccinate for. Um, it causes feed conversion loss and can really lead to some kicked up, really nasty respiratory issues. Um, it kind of just exposes the lungs. Uh, it, it, it affects the cilia in the, in the throat and it exposes the lungs and the bronchial tubes to viruses, bacteria, dust, debris, and then it causes pneumonia. So so the, there's different things we can prevent by just giving a, a 30 cent shot per pig or um, like lip, uh, ferrosure, it's like a dollar per pig. Uh, Iliitis is like 20 or 30 cents per pig. Uh, PCV, I can't remember how much PCV is per pig at the moment. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big proponent for vaccinating for everything. I mean, there's 10 or 12 diseases that I haven't really talked about. Mm -hmm. Those are the endemic ones. Those are the ones that are pretty much just across America. So would you say you've seen some of these diseases and some of the blood tests you've done on your herd from time to time or because uh, I've seen on my herd, I've seen ileitis. Um, so ileitis is present. Um, I've seen one variety of lepto at one point before we started doing uh, vaccinations. I saw lepto pomona. Um, but other than that, I haven't seen any of the other ones as far as that goes. Um, then I have seen one case of tetanus on my farm. We castrated a, a young boar, and uh, it wasn't because he was too old or castrated late. He was pretty darn young. But I want to say it was three or four weeks after we castrated him. And it's like, wow, you you look like you're wasting away. What's wrong with you? You're just kind of puny. And I mean, he was doing better than that. And I'm really personal with my herd. And so I just kept watching him. And then all of a sudden I woke up one morning and walked out. And he's laying on his side with his legs sticking out. Mm. And I'm like, well, that doesn't look good. I went out and he was completely alive and, and, and alert and he just couldn't move. He yeah. was frozen. And I called my vet and I'm like, all right, we got tetanus. And we talked about it for a little bit and started administering antitoxin. And then we administered a vaccine to the rest of the group just, just as a 
precautionary since we had vaccinated and we administered antitoxin to all of them and vaccine at the same time. And I haven't administered vaccine since, so it's kind of a roll of the dice. But in the last four years, that was my first litter ever. Hmm. But in the last four years, I've made sure that we're on different ground when we castrate, where the pigs are clean. Uh, I don't go wiping them down with iodine or anything. That's not what I mean. Um, and it is, it's like a roll of the dice by me not vaccinating them. But I had to see if I ever had another incidence of it. I, I, I just, like I said, I just didn't, I don't believe in vaccinating for absolutely everything. But that boar made it through. I'll, I'll give you the brief story. But I picked him up every day, and I gave him a slurry of food, and he he sucked it up, and he got better within a, a week, and he got totally better within about two weeks. Um, but I see why humans get the tetanus vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't ever want to see a human have to deal with that. And I don't mean to be insensitive to pigs, um, but I, I really see why why we all get that. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's bad news for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, so those were the endemic ones. Those that, that was just the endemic diseases, the things that we protect against. So w- when you are vaccinating is depending depending on what you're vaccinating for, are you administering that at different times or is it uh, I have a have a specific schedule when when we farrow, when we have a sow that's uh, that's been bred, when we bring a new um, a new animal yes. to the farm? Any new animal gets all of the vaccines as if I don't know their vaccine history. Um, young piglets get the iliatus PCV erysipelas vaccines and the myco and the breeding herd has already had all of those yet the breeding herd as well so so all sows all boars and young gilts all get pharaoh shergol b uh, every quarter so that's three to four times a year um, and i know i only breed twice a year when so the boars get it a little more frequently um, there's a little bit of overlapping immunity with that, um, so it is a little more frequent. Um, the, a lot of people I hear say, well, I give it before I breed each time, and that's twice a year. Um, but there's been recommendations coming down the pipeline to do it every quarter just because it does not protect longer than three months. Hmm. Um, and I do not do tetanus personally. I do not vaccinate for pneumonia currently i have never done it I've, I've considered it but i've never done it i've yet to see a case of swine flu let's not, we'll knock on wood there buddy um because that can become a nasty one but uh and, and that's more of a winter season um migratory birds i've been told bring can bring it through bring it around spread it um i do not vaccinate for atrophic rhinitis coccidiosis i don't vaccinate for prrs um, I've heard awesome things and substandard things about the PRRS vaccine. So, you know, everybody has their own opinion. So, um, but, uh, there's, there's a few that I do vaccinate for, but there's a lot that I do not vaccinate for. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, when it comes time for vaccinating, are, is that something you're doing yourself or are you relying on your vet to take care of that? Yes, we, we do it ourselves. Um, we intramuscular injections through all of those. Uh, the only subcutaneous injection we do is Ivomec, and that's a very rare, very rare thing for us to do. We do that typically in May and June just for ticks. And there are some tick-borne diseases, so we, we do use the Ivomec just to prevent tick, is- tick issues. And, boy, it keeps the tick numbers down on our farm, too. Hmm. Um, that's a big thing. So uh, uh, that uh, you know, okay, just uh, this is a rabbit trail here because just because I'm curious, what is your what is your ideal tool for uh, for injecting? I know, like I yeah, I've, I've found the slap shot quite a few years ago. Really enjoy using that. But uh, do you have? Oh yes. With with your with your level of production, are you finding other tools that have been very helpful? Yes, uh, we use the repeater guns that come from Allflex. Uh, there's another company that makes them. I can't think of it right now. Uh, so we'll use the 0.2 cc and the, the I'm sorry the 2 cc and the 5 cc. So those can be tinkered with and taken up or down to I think different measurements. And so the young piglets get one cc and others get two ccs. And um, 
if I was doing a whole bunch of it, I would just load my 50cc all flex syringe. Um, it clicks once each time for every cc administered. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'm doing the entire breeding herd, I would I would use my slap shot with the 50cc repeater, uh, and it really speeds up the task. You just throw down some feet, grab a livestock marker, I mark a pig, I shoot the pig, I mark a pig, I sorry inject the pig right. yeah. <laughs> i mark the pig and inject the pig and <laughs> i don't i don't inject and then mark because i've learned that i don't always get that pig <laughs> right right exactly you know that that reminds me of a funny story and and, and just uh indulge me for a second with an anecdote here so the same situation in the uh in the corral with a herd that i'm uh that i'm injecting and i've got my son i think he was he's probably 14 at the time maybe even younger and uh, so I gave him spray marker, and I, I said, as I, I said, as you see me inject one, you spray their, I think I said butts, I, it, spray their butts with a with a marker, and uh, of course you know I'm just focused on making sure I'm getting the right pigs and you know not getting pushed around all that type of stuff, and after about four or five I look back and and uh, my son he had he was so detail oriented he was spraying their anuses I mean literally. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally spray paint because he was using a bright red, and it's like it looked like it looked like a horrible, horrible bleeding condition because he was spray painting their anuses like he was like he was trying to just oh seal gosh. them up. He said, "Dad, you said spray their butts." <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I did yeah, it, Dad. So, yeah, Bonus point. Exactly. So I'm like, well, we don't have to be that uh, that precise. Let's let's just get some marking on the pig, and we'll be good to go. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I do, I need to get online. I need to post a video of me doing, using a, a, a hog snare and administering something. I, I've got a couple that I, I've had a cough lately that I was going to give some Batril to just because they have, have a cough and it seems to not be going away. And, but I do it myself. I'll snare the animal, hold the snare and, and do the injection. And it's a little tricky, but. It, it you don't have to have a, a sidekick with you all the time mm-hmm. um when now when you're pushing out a lot of vaccine shots and stuff if or if you had to treat the whole herd for something uh, altogether for example if you had a breakout of what would that be i think erysipelas so in a, in a breeding herd if you didn't vaccinate and you had a bunch of abortions taking place and you started taking pigs temperatures and you notice you have really, I think it's air syphilis, can get like really, really high temperatures, and that's why they abort. Hmm. So, and in that situation, you need to sweep the whole herd with penicillin or something very similar. Um, and so that's like eight doses. That's tw- twice a day for four days. So you don't want to give 40 shots twice a day for four days. That's like four or five or six bottles of penicillin. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of time on your hands. So, so, it, and it would be best to have a sidekick for something like that. But, uh, once again, that damage control with the vaccine kind of pays off if you were to ever have that breakout. Yeah. It's definitely, like you said, it's, uh, it's a, that old ounce of prevention. <laughs> this is worth a pound of cure. Yeah. So definitely. That makes sense there. Well, definitely. Okay. Well, obviously, man, we've, we've covered a lot of ground here, but what about, um, Hmm. What about, let me, let me go to my questions here. Cause man, I, you, you really got me thinking about quite a few things there. So looking at, um, so, so our, our listeners, uh, that may be, and not at the production level that you are, or even some of uh, the smaller homestead producers, what would you, what would your recommendations be on where to start? So let's say you've got, you've got a couple breeders, you're, you're raising pigs for finishing, uh, and 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 maybe you don't necessarily see any symptoms right now, but what would you recommend? Okay, here's where you need to start. This is step number one. If if you wanted to expand and get bigger, you know that risk level increases. So that's when you really want to break out and say, I either want to do this, what I consider right. I'm I'm not going to say that I'm the only way. That is by far the by far my my viewing. That's just how I take my my game. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, if you're expanding more than two and you want to do different, I think you need to be screening your herd. 
you you would you would want to find a veterinarian from somewhere and bring them in and do blood tests and you'd want to screen for iliatus pcv erysipelas parva leptomyco um yeah uh, you know pneumonia and swine flu those are periodic you don't really scan for those you could scan for rhinitis you could scan for um prrs exposure um as as different parts of the world we have different problems like in texas they have a larger feral hog population than anywhere um iowa they have a larger commercial and domestic pig population than anywhere else and that kind of bleeds on into illinois and indiana and wisconsin in that region lower minnesota so for for that end for that region right there, if I wanted a breeding herd, I would probably just systematically, I would start scanning for PRR, PRRS every quarter if I have a breeding herd because it can be brought in. We don't really understand all the ways and reasons of why people get PRRS, pigs, people's herds. Right. Um so I don't. I didn't want to make it sound like it was a zoonotic disease, like humans can get it. <laughs> right. I, don't, I didn't want to be that way. Um, but so screening, screening is really that. You, even with two pigs, you want to get under a measure of biosecurity. You want to know where the risk can come from, and how you can at least protect your two pigs if that's all you want to have. Um, you're a homesteader, an actual homesteader. There's a level of risk if you lose your two pigs. And under that theory, you want to be sustainable. So you're not sustainable when your two pigs die. Yeah. Um, but you're also not sustainable when you put in hundreds of dollars just to come up with 50 pounds of pork. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. There's There's got to be a balance there, like you said, based upon the size of your operation. There has to be a balance there. Now, you said one thing, which obviously resonates with me because I'm in this situation where uh, we do not have a veterinarian anywhere around us that has any pig experience in fact the the closest one was was like three hours away and when i talked to him at one time about some testing they said you need to bring bring that sow to us i'm like man i'm not loading up my 600, <laughs> 600 pound sow and bringing it three hours up and then three hours back that that ain't happening so yeah um, so are there in, you know, with technology and the in the access we have to uh to the internet and amazon and all these type of things are there any are there any options there where if you don't have a, a vet on site Yes, the I'm not really fluent in some of that, but on the PRRS discussion, that's your biggest one for reproductive issues. Um, you know, just about anybody can go and get uh, Ferrosure and protect your breeding herd from air syphilis, parvo, and lepto just with a shot. Yeah. So um, a lot of people say the PRRS vaccine doesn't work very well, and that can just wipe out your litters and prevent you from six months or longer, even if you don't take care of it. So mm -hmm. you can do a, a saliva test there. I was going to say the technical term for it, but I can't, I'm not going to pronounce that properly. Is it like, um, a, like a rope test? Is that what that is? Yeah. 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 You just, you put out like a, a, a brand new clean, sterile mop head, like a rag mop. And now I'll put it this way. My vet came out one day to to run because we had a clean herd and so she wanted a control measure for them to develop a new vaccine at Merck and so she comes out with um, a couple mop heads and she goes all right I just need to get your pigs to chew on this it shouldn't take 10 minutes she puts that mop head out there and my pigs kind of looked at it like well that was cool I'm gonna go over here now <laughs> exactly <laughs> and she's she's we stood there for 30 minutes an hour just talking and and observing and walking around the herd and she's like your pigs don't want this mop in five minutes this mop would have been totally covered in saliva in a confinement system exactly yeah. so she's like your pigs aren't bored so we had to swap over and do blood samples and so there we had to snare every one of these animals and draw blood samples and that's step two i don't know how to do blood samples so i don't know if you do troy but I've I've seen my vet do it. She sticks a really long spinal tap needle up into the neck and draws from the artery. Yeah. So I don't know how to do that myself. She's told me to stab in there and feel for the sponge like, and then you pull back a touch and draw. I've just never done it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not experienced in that area either. 
Um, but she said that you can also cause them to bleed out and you need to make sure they're holding still. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, there, there are definitely some issues there. <laughs> there. There's your warning. This was a disclaimer. Right, right. Um, but, but yes, the saliva test when they chew on stuff, um, stool samples for certain things. Um, for example, if you want to find out if you have positive lepto in your herd, you have to do a urine analysis multiple times. It's not just a one-time test because it could be subclinical. It, it could have low titers, medium-level titers, or high titers. And what I mean by that is the test will come back and it'll say 100, 200, 400, or 800. And the higher, well, the higher or lower, I can't remember how that fluctuates, how that how they read that. But yeah, one in one in 800 is like an outbreak. One in – no, I'm so sorry. 400 out of 800 is like a, an outbreak, and then they have to – if you want to find out if they're shedding, you have to gather urine samples multiple times to see if they're actually shedding lepto. Mm. So that's – those. there's different variants, um, and you can't do a pregnancy test on a pig. I've already went through that route. You have to <laughs> – you, you have to observe the breeding, uh, use a preg tone – or you just have to wait in the old-fashioned way and see if they have them because okay. the the estrogen levels are off the wall different times of pregnancy or the, during their cycling, so they just can't tell through, like, human pregnancy tests. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But just had to throw that out there. Definitely. So what, um, what about – so what about uh, – do you have any opinion or you have any experience with – Again, thinking of smaller producers that are looking at more of these natural remedies, because I can hear some people kind of knee jerking and saying, well, wait a minute, pastured hogs are supposed to be naturally raised. You know, we're selling this high end meat so that people aren't going to something that's been shot up with a bunch of stuff. I can, I can hear some of the naysayers saying some of that. And, well, I only, right. I only use this. I only do that. I only use natural methods for my herd. I, I, I'm sure you've got an opinion on that. So let, let, share that with us. Yeah, definitely. Uh I'm quite a holistic person myself. I'm an organic farmer. I'm, I, I eat very healthy. I, I really watch my P's and Q's and I dot my I's and cross my T's. I mean, I really, really, uh, I could talk all day about eating and living very healthy. Um, my pig herd for me is a bit of an exception. It's just like my children. Um, and I won't get all political, but I don't vaccinate my children for everything under the sun. I, I skip out on the flu. I skip out on the pneumonia. There's a few I do, but I get the big ones. Um, but I treat my pig herd the same way. I don't want my pigs being sick and suffering. Um, I treat them like I would a human. Um, I, I do deworm. We feed them a really healthy diet. Um, they need adequate space and ventilation good biosecurity it's really good to hit it on the head ahead of time so i don't have to be dosing out antibiotics every month or two months or putting antibiotics in the feed or um so i'm talking about preventative measures uh diatomaceous earth for example i, I i've heard people brag about it and i just don't believe it exists in a, a beneficial world for pigs it, it may cut up fleas or ticks but those are really sub substandard issues when we're talking about pigs um parasites i have heard pumpkin seeds work as far as for par uh, internal parasites i've heard black walnut tincture works for parasites uh, internal parasites not all though i mean we're talking about skipping out on lungworms and a couple of other things right. um ivomec works really good but if you have whipworms ivomec doesn't even touch a whipworm and that can cause screaming scours and piglets, and they'll die of dehydration before you even know it once they wean. You won't notice it till they wean. So Ivomec works, but at the same time, if you've got a type of worm that Ivomec won't touch, uh, it's time for some safeguard. Um, I've watched humans drink safeguard. They were actually um, – now, I've, I was reading on a homesteading forum last night um, <laughs> on think, on stuff like that. I think I saw the same thread because <laughs> I was thinking yeah. the same thing that yeah somebody was talking about uh, a, a wormer for human consumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were actually talking about pinworms, and it's like you know you'll get a hundred people on there that are like, go to a doctor, you're going to die. Right. And then yeah. you'll get you'll get a couple good good suggestions in there in the middle. You got to weed through it all, but. But yeah, some people were like, safeguard's really harmless, and 
I, and it is. It's a. It, it, I don't know if it's harmless, but it's a softer version. It's it's not as hardcore of a, a killer. <laughs> it's a. Uh, yeah, I saw. There's Ivo Mac and yeah, I saw where somebody sure. even said that uh, UNICEF and and NATO yep. uh, are are recommending, and I don't remember, so I'm not going to say it because I don't remember which one it was. We're recommending, well, that, yeah, this is what we use for for human treatment. That's so. great because that was my comment, Troy. Oh, was it? Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, that's why I, I, hey, I'm just kind of skimming through. I didn't uh, see that name. All right, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, they do. They recommend that in third world countries. Um, so it's what, actually used in America too. So was that Ivomec or was that Safeguard or what was what was the what was Ivomec? Name? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we have really, we have really gone down a rabbit trail, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, it's all good. Uh, um. But yeah, so so we cover the parasite protection, we cover the nutrition, we cover the environment. We really, we really try to stay away from having to treat our pigs. Um, I use Tulsi, uh, holy basil is what it's called, and it's really amazing stuff. As far as it's not a magic tincture, but it controls mucus production. Um, it's a sterilizing agent because of the camphor in it and the menthol. And there's you could read up on Tulsi. Tulsi tea, holy basil, you can read up on that forever. So we grow a hundred foot row of it, dry it ourselves, and we use it in, we make a tea. Um, so we use that. We put apple cider vinegar in their water. Um, I've heard of people, I don't remember why, but they did, they put peroxide in the water. Hmm. Um, I, I don't remember why at the moment. I know when doing fodder, you can put a little peroxide in the water and it'll kill out a lot of the molds and stuff that affect your barley fodder. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Why, why deal with the mold in the fodder when you can kill it ahead of time? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. so there's your home remedy. That's, that's as far as I can go on that. Okay. okay. But, uh, well, man, this is, this is some great info and I, I, I try to keep this conversation less than an hour and we're creeping up on, uh, on that mark. But I do want to ask you, so, so obviously you've been a lexicon of information here when it comes to uh, disease control and biosecurity. Where would you suggest if if somebody wanted to to lead uh, learn more on this? Like you say, they're a smaller producer. Maybe they want to grow and they think, man, I, I want to start somewhere, but I don't know where to trust the sources. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? What books do I read? What forums do I get on? What what type of advice would you give for somebody for that? Oh my. Um... You know, I use Iowa State's resources quite a bit, so I'll Google Iowa State swine diseases and I read up on it. Or I use the pig site a lot, uh, the pigsite.com. Uh, so I'll go to Google and I'll say pig diseases, the pig site, and I'll hit search. And um, so you're, you're going to get a list of all the pig diseases or uh, vaccines or uh, – there's a lot of resources out there that I don't even touch or scratch. Um, I've got things I've never even read. Um, I, I ask a lot of producers, a lot of questions and my veterinarian, she's just, she's been a wealth of knowledge and information for me. So I know some people don't really have that resource, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but, it, but just starting out, I suggest to sit down on the internet cause it's widely available almost everywhere. and Just type and read. Don't try to read too much and get too in depth with it, but know your risks. Um, and uh, I, I really worry about the health of my animals, so that's another thing that I really research a lot: is healthy swine, healthy rations. What do they really need? Yeah, and uh, just go from there. Yeah, and you know, and and like we talked about before, with technology at our disposal. Uh, you know, mentorship is huge in, in any farming endeavor, almost any professional endeavor. Uh, mentorship is huge. And if you don't have a, a pig producer nearby, you don't have that vet nearby, then we can rely on technology. I mean, that's that's why all of us belong to these uh, Facebook groups and those other social media groups. It's not because we, we necessarily want to see each other's pictures of pigs. And that's, that's part of yeah. it. But we can share information. Yeah, again, you just... Just in, in getting to know you in the last three months, you and I have had communication uh, uh, back and forth about things. And it's you know, it's great to be able to share that information with one another and say, well, you know, here's what I've experienced. Try this. And, and uh, yeah. I think that's a huge benefit that you know, farmers you know, 30, 40 years ago didn't have uh, didn't have at their disposal. Absolutely. Yeah. That pastured pig forum on Facebook, for example, I, I really suggest people to not always type, how do I deworm a pig? 
go into the search bar and type the word deworming or worming. I know we're not worming them, but the point is, is not everybody uses the word deworm. Right. So you got to think outside the box a little bit with your search cues and words, but that search engine in the pastured pig forum, pastured pigs, that's a, that's a really good forum right there. There's like 15,000 members in it. And so you're going to really get a hundred or more results in that search. And some of them are going to go back down to 2015 or 14 or 2012. And, uh, I see, I see this new for new, new platform coming in called me, we, and I'm interested to get on that and see what's going on with it. And there's another social media site for farmers. Oh, I, I wish I knew the name of it at the moment. Um, but there, that's just farming. There's, yeah. there's not, it's not a lot of social blah, 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 but it's all about farming and I don't know if you know that, Troy. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of it too. It seemed like it had the word ranch in it or something, but but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's a whole other podcast discussion about how uh, access to these forums on Facebook may be a a uh, you know something that could be disappearing. So we need to even safeguard ourselves there to to find platforms or find other areas where we can communicate and not be regulated or restricted. Absolutely. Go to your go. You can go to your farm page, and you can back up all your data, so you can save everything that's already currently on your farm page. Um, Google that if you want to. I'm really glad you touched base on that because I think we should be talking about that We're right now. At the segue of things really becoming volatile as far as you're here one day and not the next with Facebook. So, yeah, um, that's that's definitely on the short list of of episodes that that we're gonna do here shortly and get all our get all of our research together. But you know, talking about that from not only a a, um, a group where we share information and, and possibly losing that to uh, yeah, a lot of smaller producers rely on Facebook to to really facilitate a lot of sales. And if that goes away because uh, their stance on animal sales and, and uh, livestock for meat, then yeah. uh, you could have a huge hole in your marketing program and that could really get people upside down quick. Absolutely. I'm, uh, it, it is It's very volatile in that you know, we could be thousands and thousands of dollars in the hole on the feed bill very fast and yeah. we need a backup plan. Yeah. Um, develop that network basically. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, well, Thank you so much, Troy, for the opportunity today to, to discuss all this stuff. This has been really fun. Well, man, as usual, I enjoy talking to you. You're, you're really easy to talk to and, and wealth of information, and, and I know you've got a lot going on, and I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to come on and talk, uh, talk with me again. Um, if you don't mind, give a, give a shout-out. How, uh, how can people find you if they want to find more information about your operation or, or maybe speak to you, uh, ping some questions off of you? Um, you can always get me at my phone number. Uh, I don't need a thousand people calling it, but <laughs> yeah. well, let's maybe uh, let's let's it, maybe leave that part out and let's say find you on Facebook. How's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is, I, I will. My personal page will always be there. It's Brian Rogers. Uh, it's Mount Ida, Arkansas. But um, currently, we still have a Berkshire Prime Pork of Mount Ida Facebook page. Um, I do plan on setting up a MeWe account, and I do plan on being on that other farm forum very soon i can't remember what the name is but we'll get there yeah and uh we do still have a website right now i'm about to be renaming and doing some things um but i'll, I'll keep the berkshire prime pork page running as long as facebook allows that if i change my farm name i'll always i'll, I'll keep both farm pages functioning so um, personal page is always there, though. Brian Rogers in Mount Ida, Arkansas. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think uh, right now, while these groups are still open, just get on these pastured pig groups, and, and you'll see Brian out there, and, and obviously you can friend him and PM him and do those type of things. So, well, Yes, Brian, sir. Brian, again, appreciate your time. I uh, hope you have a great evening. I, I appreciate the time. Thank you. All you right. guys have a great night. All right, you too. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, as you can see, there's there's a lot of information there that Brian gave us, and it may be one of those things, for those of you that listen, I know we have a wide, a very eclectic audience of people that are just starting with pigs, uh, to those of you all that have pretty large operations. So those of you just starting out, if you think, wow, this is daunting, there's no way in the world I could be ready for this if I just want to get started with pigs. Uh, as he mentioned, this is kind of a process you, you work up to. Um, you know, your biosecurity isn't something that um, you need to freak out totally about or paralyze you to the point that you don't do anything. It is a serious issue. 
but uh, it's something that you can grow into as your herd grows. If you're doing a, you know, raising a couple of pigs just for personal consumption, and then of course, uh, you know, your biosecurity measures may not have to be as stringent. But uh, feel free to check out some of those uh, some of those things that uh, Brian referenced. You can obviously Google a lot of those things. I'm going to provide a link to his information uh, below in the show description. And uh, feel free to check that out. Uh, but also, some of the Facebook forums, uh, pasture pig forums that uh, that you'll see on Facebook. Brian is an active participant on that, so you can. Uh, he's very gracious and willing to answer questions. You can reach out to him in that direction as well. Well, again, everybody, appreciate you listening. If you want to know more about our operation here at Red Tool House, just uh, you can go to our website, redtoolhouse.com, and check us out. Uh, we have, I, I want to apologize to all of you people. We put a call out on Facebook looking for additional interview uh, guests. And, uh, man, you guys really stepped up. I, I got inundated with uh, interview requests. And I tried to do my interviews in batches, so I actually filled up my entire schedule for September uh, for interviews. But if, if I haven't reached out to you yet, please um, please just be patient. I'll reach out to you, and we'll get an October schedule going. Um if I, I, you don't hear from me in, a, in about a week, uh, please just send me another message. I, I hope that nobody slipped through the cracks, but uh, as much information I had coming in through all these different channels, uh, I'm afraid I may have missed one or two of you. Well, I hope everyone has a great week. Take care, everybody. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Pasture Pig Podcast. To learn more about our podcast or to submit topics or recommend guests for future episodes, visit redtoolhouse.com. 